Terminator 2 Judgment Day brings back the return of James Cameron producing and directing and this was released in 1991. This is, I don't know how anticipated of a sequel but I'm sure it was anticipated at some level but I don't think anybody was expecting on what level of a sequel we were going to be getting in 1991. Um, and it basically, as everybody knows already, took everything about the first film and enhanced it, plus a few other things by, you know, changing up some character dynamics and stuff like that. But this is, without a doubt, a bigger and much more loud picture than what we got, which was already amazing in my opinion. And as I have said in the last review, uh, comparing this one to... The first one. This is an amazing feat and I take absolutely nothing away from it, but I have my preference on the first film as a whole and I just think it's more of a perfect film than this one is, although this one is quite perfect and, you know, only by a sliver below uh, the first one. I think that just comes with the first one kind of inventing the idea and being the OG kind of thing. And this one obviously is bigger and better, but uh, like in, in production wise. But uh, I don't know, I just love that concept of the first film. It's just so great in and out, and uh, I just love it for what it is. So, Terminator 2, though, that's what we're here to discuss. Um, like I said, anybody who hasn't seen the Terminator films, just go watch the films before you watch this review, unless you really don't give a shit. But I'm going to be talking about things in this review that are 100% spoiler, and I'm going to be discussing things that I... Um, experience with these films by watching them without knowing anything about them other than, you know, a machine is in them and, and the machine is badass. But uh, I didn't get any spoilers going in. I watched these for the first time in my early 20s, I think. And um, there's a lot about these films that took me by surprise. And I appreciate the fact that they took me by surprise and, um, and I wasn't spoiled on these things because they just enhanced the movies for me. So go watch the film. Like, that's my strong recommendation, because here on out, I'm spoiling everything. Uh, basically, we have Sarah's mo uh, dialogue kind of narrating the opening of the film. And again, we get really quick with the two Terminators being sent back. Um, it is two Terminators this time, or at least two machines. So it's not a Terminator and a human being sent back this time. It's two machines, one protector, one, uh, one villain, one, you know, traditional Terminator kind of thing. And um, so Sarah opens up the film. I like her dialogue. I like how she's written. I like how the opening is written. And she's like um, one Terminator and set back and one lone protector. Uh, just a question of which would reach uh, John first. And she starts to give a little bit of a, what's it called? Um, a lore and kind of like a catch up on the first film, I guess, for people who haven't watched the first film. But uh, you should watch the first film before you watch the second film. It's just a recommendation. And uh, then we have... Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator go into a dive bar, which is absolutely hilarious, and it kind of is in the vein of him meeting up with those punks in the first film. And in this one, he walks up to this biker and he's like, I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. And I love the biker's reaction with, you forgot to say please, and blows the, the smoke in him. Like, <laughs> obviously, again, because these bikers and these bar attendees and bartenders and everything know that they're, there's a, a lot more of them than there is this one random dude coming into the bar. But uh, obviously he starts to, the Terminator, I mean, starts to create havoc and throw people around like they're friggin' rag dolls and throws one guy into an oven and is like, his hands start to burn on the stove. And uh, of course he gets his clothes and boots and then he goes off to the motorcycle and the bartender comes out with a shotgun and is like, can't let you take the man's wheel, son. And uh, that gets dealt with pretty quick with <laughs> with Arnold. I really like that. And then we're introduced to John. A lot of people love John Connor in this film, and a lot of people love Edward Furlong, Eddie Furlong, as John Connor, and I don't mind him. He's good. Um, I don't know if this is his first role. It does say introducing Edward Furlong, but I'm not sure if he didn't have a role ever before this movie. Um, but he he has some quirks. Like, he, he can be annoying. He can be a little shit, like... <laughs> douchebag sometimes and just very immature I would say but you can't say that doesn't go with this character either um I don't know it's just something about him there's this little like immature attitude he has and and I'm sure he was written that way on purpose but uh 
he's just so badass and he's trying so hard to be badass with his being like disrespectful to his foster parents and everything and you you kind of get annoyed by John Connor but at the same time once you think about everything that's going on everything starts to make sense if he was being like passed around through foster homes his mother was put away for being crazy um, his mother basically like raised him not like a son but more of an actual soldier like she's not mother like later on in the film but you start to see that she's not she was never mother like to this kid and she raised him to like defend himself and protect himself but obviously didn't raise him as a normal kid so he's gonna have some you know social um issues i guess in 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 a realistic sense he would but um the actor himself like edward furlong he he, he does his job i can't say he's he's a bad actor or anything like that i just John, as a as a pre teen, I guess himself, just has some quirks that kind of uh, irritated me a little bit. But uh, that's just like a, a minor thing. Most of the, for the most part, he's fine. And of course, we get introduced to badass Sarah Connor. She's just doing chin ups, and she turns to the camera the first time we see her face. She's like, "Morning, doctor. How's your knee?" And it's the same guy who plays that doctor. Um, Earl Bowen is the actor, and he portrays. Uh, I wrote his name down i'll get to it dr peter silberman apparently he plays the same doctor from the first second and third film so um i guess he changes positions <laughs> like like job uh titles often but uh he's playing the same character i thought maybe he was playing a different like he was uh working for the police station in the first film and then it, now he's working in the psych ward uh, but it, apparently it's the same character so he uh, we're introduced to him too and he brings us to sarah connor and She's a very, very different um, character in this film. And again, I'll get into that too com in comparison with her to the first film because she is a wildly different personality in this film for better and for worse. Like she still has her Sarah Connor like um, classic tropes, I guess, but she can also be a little bit insufferable. <laughs> um, and again, these are things that when you start to think of why it makes sense, you know, like you would be paranoid, you would be, you know, mentally distraught if you had a Terminator try to kill you kind of thing and something that's not even existent in this realm, in this dimension of time that this movie takes place in 1991 uh, and you're dealing with this thing from 20 whatever. So again, there's no, there's no um, illogicness to it, but it's just... She does have some personality traits that, that is, are a little bit mean-spirited and a little bit um, not fun and not enjoyable um, that you kind of have to accept and understand in a sense. This movie, like, James Cameron does really darken this up. He did with the first one, too, but, like, there's a lot of mean-spirited moments in this film. There's a lot of, like, moments where it's just grim and dark and bleak and uh hopeless again there's a lot of hopeless hopelessness in this film it's a little bit more spread out and a little bit few and far in between compared to the hopelessness of the first film but uh, it's still there and john Cam or james cameron sorry uh knows how to deliver it for sure and then we uh we follow john for most of the first act of the film and then these two terminators are are trying to get to him uh robert patrick portraying the T-1000 in this one, goes to visit the foster parents and gets a picture of John and is trying to find him. And then they end up in this arcade. There's this one scene where Robert Patrick has a cop car and uh, he's talking to these two girls and one of them is a redhead. And from my fan theory, I swear, that has to be Catherine from uh, Terminator 3, which I'll be talking about next. But for anybody who's seen Terminator 3, Catherine Brewster, I'm assuming it was that little girl because... They knew each other when they were this age, and it's talked about a little bit in the third film. But my fan theory is that's Catherine Brewster saying, oh, I, you know, I haven't seen John Con uh, Connor in a while or whatever she says. I think that's Catherine Brewster. Then he goes with his buddy who has like the, well, his best mullet ever a thing. <laughs> his hair is ridiculous. This ginger kid with like just straight down the back mullet, like pure mullet kind of thing. They're at an arcade and then the two Terminators show up at the arcade and uh, you go to the, the hallway in the back and like I was mentioning, when I watched this, I thought Arnold Schwarzenegger was the villain and Robert Patrick was the hero who was going to be protecting John. Swear to God. 
swear to God, I thought that I was not spoiled in this film, and that was a badass moment when I saw Schwarzenegger actually be the hero, and they switched things around, so Schwarzenegger is now the guy protecting John, and it's Robert Patrick who's the the villain who was programmed to destroy John. That was cool, and I'm glad I wasn't spoiled for that, and I'm I watched this like somebody would watch it in 1991 when this film came out, um, unless the marketing was horrible, I don't know. I was two in 1991, so I didn't watch this in 1991, clearly, uh, or see the trailers for it or anything, but uh, if the marketing was done well, and the marketing kept that from the audience and, and didn't spill that Arnold Schwarzenegger was going to be playing a good guy, uh, they sh that's what they should have done, and I hope that's what they did. But uh, then there's that shootout. It's amazing. It leads to a motorcycle chase, you know, down the streets. Uh, Robert Patrick's T-1000 uh, hijacks a truck and just drives it right over the bridge. It was funny seeing this film a little bit closer this time, and I would pause the, the chase scene sometimes, and you can 100% tell that there's a stuntman often riding the bike, especially when the bike is going off the ramps and stuff. And at one point when the, the Terminator is grabbing John from his, like, bike, uh, whatever he drives, a, a motor, not really a motorcycle, but a dirt bike, there you go. His, uh, off his dirt bike and onto Schwarzenegger's uh, chopper kind of thing. That is 100% stuntman, and it looks nothing, like, zero, like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's kind of funny. Like you pause the film, and that is a totally different person on that bike for those, you know, second to a second and a half, how long it was, however long it was. And Sarah is trying to kind of um, do the best she can to get to more minimum security on where she's being located because she's in maximum maximum right now and um she's trying to convince the psychiatrist that uh you know she's getting better and stuff like that and it's it's mentioned that she believes that um at the end of the first film when that terminator was crushed that the company skynet was covering it up and um he's like you know also oh, the psychiatrist is like oh so you don't believe anymore that uh that there was a Terminator at all in that factory, and, and uh, she's like, yeah, they would have uh, found some evidence if there was. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty damn hard to cover that up. Like, And later on in the film, they start to get into that subject again, but um, factually, the company did cover that robot up, but would it, like, it? it's hard to believe, it's hard to believe they could in the first place. Um, but it's hard to believe, like, why they would either, because that's a revolutionary find. So to cover it up and, and bury it and just keep it in, like, the elites kind of thing, um, does it, and then send Sarah to the mental hospital, even though she's right about everything, is it, uh, is that the step to take? Like, um, because obviously they continued finding this thing that was broken and they continued with the research and technology and Skynet went forward and Cyberdyne went forward and everything. Um, I just don't think it would work. It would play that way. Um, I think something like that and finding something like that, that chip is pretty revolutionary and I don't think it would be covered up that easily. Um, that would be one hell of a feat. Uh, for all the conspiracy people, you know, like, um, when, when people say, like, oh, if, 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 if a conspiracy was true, millions of people would have to be behind it, so somebody would be whistleblowing at some point, and that's quite true. That's quite true. Like, <laughs> it would take probably billions of people to be behind that, and, uh, yeah, I think somebody would whistleblow pretty fast, but... I'm not a conspiracy channel, I'm a movie review channel, so I'm um, just thinking, I, I think hiding a Terminator arm and hiding a Terminator chip in 1991 and succeeding in covering it up from everybody would be difficult, that's all I'm saying. And kind of pointless too, because like I said, uh, it, that's something that would be remarkable to show the world kind of thing, but anyway. I digress. I like Arnold Schwarzenegger's shotgun savviness where he's like twirling the shotgun and shooting it one-handed. Uh, that whole stunt scene and, and uh, truck uh, truck chase and bike chase, you could say, um, is pretty awesome. The foster mom, uh, she is from Aliens and I think she plays a Hispanic woman in Aliens and they did give her some like brown um, skin paint to darken her skin. 
which I guess some people find racist, but she's play, she's an actress playing the character. I don't see the racism in it. But it's cool to see her in a drastically uh, different role because I didn't know it was the same woman until I saw in some uh, movie review thing or from somebody else. Um, it, it's just like because her character in Aliens and her character in this is like way different, like totally, totally different look on the woman. So good on her for being able to be that diverse. It's cool to see that. Um, but yeah, the T-1000 makes it to the foster parents first and kills them both and imitates the mom and she's on the phone. And I like uh, the T-101 Arnold Schwarzenegger's trick where he, he asks John what the dog's name is and then he says Wolfie instead. And the woman on the other line is like, Wolfie's just fine. So that has him clue in that it's not the mom, the foster mom, it's the... It's the T-1000. And then back at the mental ward, um, Sarah Connor's there, and she chooses to purposely go catatonic when the police are there, showing her a bunch of pictures of the Terminator. Pictures from 1984 compared to pictures that they just took then in 1991 at a mall at a shopping center, and it's the same guy. And they're questioning Sarah. Um, like, we know you know this guy. It, it's like, yeah, that's why she's in the... Mental word. Has she not mentioned him before? Like, you're you're asking as if this guy is like some regular Joe. She gave you this whole story on who this guy is. And they should have all the information that Sarah has already given them. So for them to come to the mental ward and go to, to Sarah Connor, this mental patient, and be like, you know this guy? It's really, really weird, again, for the cops to do. Because she's already told you everything that she knows that you don't believe. And she's not going to tell you anything new, so... I didn't get that, but she manages to get a pa um, paper clip, and she uses this to escape after being licked by that one guard. <laughs> I've always found that scene strange. The buddy with the glasses just leans down and fucking licks the woman. And then John, uh, realizing that he can command his own Terminator, tells the Terminator to go uh, to the mental ward. But I love those guys that... They come over, first of all, wanting to help John because John starts screaming, get this creep off of me! And these guys come along and then uh, he realizes that he can command the Terminator and he tells the Terminator to get on one leg and everything. And um, the guys come in and there's, he's like, yeah, you're okay, kid? And then John, of course, is like, get the fuck out of here, losers, or whatever he says. It's like, you were literally crying for help five seconds ago. It's like That's one of those quirks about John that I'm just like, dude get a life. Like, honestly, you were screaming for help, and now you think you're all tough because you got your own personal Terminator. Like, I get you're, like, 13 or something, but grow the fuck up. Like, really. Um, and uh, then there's the whole thing where t the Terminator goes to shoot them, and he's like, no, you just can't go around killing people. Why? <laughs> because you can't. You're just immoral. Why? <laughs> because you just can't, okay? I feel like that more and more as life goes on, except for punching people. When people, you can't just punch people. Why? <laughs> you can't just tell people off. Why? That's me. So everybody uh, uh, meet, meets up at the mental ward with Sarah as she's trying to escape, and her escape is good. Her escape is is believable and realistic enough, and she's smart about it. I like how she gets that syringe with that poison, that liquid. Gel, gel whatever it was and holds it to the guy's neck and um, I love her reaction when she sees Arnold Schwarzenegger for the first time and he walks and he turns and she sees that like in in the last movie he was a villain so she feels doomed and her reaction is very realistic and just her like her her cry and her facial expressions of like I'm done this is where it ends like this is where it ends she's so realistic about it and I like that a lot I love the twin uh, security guards, and I read somewhere, or I watched somewhere, I forget where though, but um, those uh, those security guards are brothers in real life, um, and they, they got them to play like twins of each, like they're, they're actual twins, and they got them to play the, their, their replicas, I guess, the real one and the replica of the guy, so I found that cool. You get the famous Terminator line, of course. Come with me if you want to live, which was Michael Binn's uh, Kyle Reese line in the first film, but now it's the Terminator as the protector. And they escape, and um, there's the whole what's wrong with your eyes thing, because the, um, the Terminator doesn't feel emotions, until, of course, they figure out that he has a CPU that can be 
uh, reset or rewired by digging it out of his skull. And um, we have Sarah Connor almost going to smash the thing because she doesn't trust the Terminator. And John comes in and uh, takes ownership and gives her, you know, a reason not to. But that whole interaction, again, that's another thing between her and John that's so not mother-like. Just the way this bitch talks to the kid is is just so, like, soldier-ish. And, and I understand she loves him because she she there is a scene, a scene later where she makes it pretty clear but she doesn't know how to raise a fucking kid yes i know because of what she's been through how would she i get it but it's like it's just like it's so unmother like it's so unnurturing the way she talks to the kid she's like fine we'll play it your way Ugh. and like just there's no there's no motherness to that to that now move you don't know what it's like to take down one of these things i don't know i'll start up i'll stop harping i love john's lingo lesson that he gives to the terminator with the hasta la vista baby and no problemo and stuff like that again him just acting like a, like too cool for school kind of thing and I don't know. It's just his age. Like I said, his character's realistic. He, even though he can be annoying, you can't say it's not realistic for who he is and, and like, being a kid, essentially. Um, he just gets on my nerves. <laughs> so they meet up with this family who I guess is living off the grid, this Mexican family, and um, they're storing guns for Sarah Connor, and they have been for years. So there's this whole, like, underground cave kind of thing that's loaded with guns like heavy artillery uh, artillery sorry and um sarah's like really good friends with these people and uh i assume they're living off the grid because they're in like a trailer in the middle of the desert so which is exactly what sarah wants to be like she wants to be off the grid herself with this whole plan that she's thinking but how she was able to manage uh collecting all those guns damn that must have took years and a lot of like fake IDs and shit like that. Um, I don't know what the laws are there where they are, but um, I mean, that's a lot of artillery <laughs> and that's a lot of questions to be asked. I guess being off grid is a lot of help because uh, like I said, that's, that's, that could start a, a good small war pretty easily. This, the Terminator smile is really funny too. When uh, he looks at the guy in his program, sees the guy smile, so he tries to imitate imitate to the smile. And I like the high five thing. All that is funny. All that is like good humor and and uh, situational humor that goes with the the story and the plot and everything. I really really did like that. Um, there's this one scene that's always stuck with me from the first time I watched this film to now, like every time I watch this film, and it's very small. But it goes with the bleak and the depressing theme of this film and Sarah Connor's really downer personality kind of thing. Um, she's sitting in the car and they get some food and she's eating a burger. And uh, John asks her, do you want some fries with that? And she doesn't move. She's just like staring. And it's it's so dark and it's so like, like you can tell this woman doesn't even she doesn't enjoy anything ever and everything is dark and grim and the end of everything like she eats to replenish energy and that's it like she doesn't enjoy a bite of that burger she doesn't enjoy anything in life at all and that's what i find that sometimes takes away from like the fun that this film has and like the first one had like it was just like a blast of a film this one is is and it had its uh bleak moments too don't get me wrong it had lots of them but in this one, like, it, it's specific little tiny moments like that that really drive in the really, really bleakness of this whole franchise, I guess, and, and the theme of it. And, and, like, she's eating that damn burger and she's just, like, like hopeless. Like, she's a shell of a human. There's, there's nothing, like, kind. There's nothing, like, hopeful. There's no soul. Like, even if she stops Judgment Day, like... Still, she's going to live her entire life paranoid, probably. Like, the way the character is. The way Sarah Connor is. Like, there's no... She's a she's a lost cause, essentially, um, in this whole ordeal. It's just... It's just it, it, 
it makes the film even more depressing, like I said. But she gets the idea uh, to go hunt down Miles Dyson, where Miles Dyson is the guy who's just about to create the the most enhanced chip kind of thing that is going to lead Sky or Cyberdyne, sorry, um, to create the Terminators. And on August ninety seven, you know, the machines start thinking for themselves, kind of thing. He's the one who's currently creating that one major chip that's leading there so she, sarah connor decides to go there and blow him away and um almost gets him but luckily his little boy likes to play with remote control cars and the remote control car hits the dad's foot and miles bends down to pick it up or something and the bullet hits the computer and then she starts going at him and uh and and that i liked that whole uh confrontation kind of thing and that's the one moment that's the one moment when sarah connor goes inside and she's like tough as nails and she's swearing and she's just like inhumane kind of thing like i said just focused on what she needs to do kind of like a terminator herself essentially and uh but then she she lightens up she gets that heart she gets that soul back and she's she she realizes what she's doing she's realizing she's fucking over a family and and she starts to like back off and and compel and control herself and gain herself kind of thing and then john and the terminator show up and um this is a realistic explanation of the terminator saying to miles dyson um what will happen in the future and he takes off the skin off his arm and it's metal and everything and this is the part where miles also mentions the chip that they found that sarah connor thought that the company was cover covering up and they were covering it up and this is like i said where i i think how realistic is this because the company found this and there's no other way there's no there's nowhere else it could have came from but the future because this technology did not exist yet so there's only one answer it's it's not a believable answer but you know, there's nowhere on current Earth, current 1984, between 84 and 1991 Earth, that this technology could have came from. So, crazy or not, it's the only reasonable explanation is that this came from who knows where. But uh, he mentions that Skynet is, or Cyberdyne is holding onto a chip that they found in the factory so this is where she starts to lose it and she's just like yeah i knew they were covering it up and i mean fuck how many things do they cover up shit you know people <laughs> people who are deemed crazy sometimes aren't crazy well we all know that but um so yeah they they were covering this chip up and the whole fucking terminator arm too which they they found and you know oh you know it can't be from the future well then where is it from I don't know, this technology doesn't exist yet, but I don't know, there's got to be a reasonable explanation for it. We'll find it, I guess, sometime. <laughs> Whatever. Um, and then this basically leads to the third act of the film where um, Miles is convinced and he goes to Cyberdyne Industry and or Inc., whatever, uh, the corporation, and destroys all the chips and research and everything so nobody can follow it. All that's great. I love, love the Gatling gun uh, shootout that Schwarzenegger has with the cops. And he's very clever and he leaves zero casualties, which I like how they play that because John told him not to kill anybody and he can't kill anybody. And of course, uh, Schwarzenegger's like, trust me. And he just blows them all the way, but doesn't kill anybody. He just blows up the cars and everything. The grenades, everything was awesome. This is what most people, this is why most people love this film and place it as the best Terminator and even better than the first one is because of scenes like that. And I, I can't disagree. If Terminator 2 is your favorite over the first one, I can't disagree. I'm not saying it's not a better movie. I'm saying I don't like it as much as the first one. I think the first one, there's the first one, which is number one for me and there's the second one which is my second favorite um and then i think salvation would probably be my third favorite maybe i have to watch the third and the fourth back to back but i like them both and then after your your shootout at the the lab you have another chase which is fantastic and that leads to the steel melting factory and everything is great there too um the smashing of uh schwarzenegger's head by the t-1000 with that giant piece of steel uh he goes down and uh him trying to imitate sarah and pointing the thing at her face and is like call for john 
and um, when he gets shot with the grenade and blows up into this creature that looks like it's something from the thing where the head is hanging down here and the arm is up here and it's just this big kerfuffle of, of liquid metal. I love that. I love the the liquid nitrogen truck uh, that, you know, rolls out and then it spills liquid nitrogen everywhere and, and freezes the T-1000. Everything is, there's just so many great moments in those two set pieces, the corporation and the factory. Just one after the other. It just, it's exciting. It makes the movie fly by, and uh, I just love it. And I love the, the way this film concluded, too, where um, Schwarzenegger can't self-terminate, so he asks to be lowered himself, and he's the last chip to have to be destroyed so that Skynet can't move forward. And uh, it's emotional. It's very emotional. I like how he started to develop human tendencies and human emotions slowly. Um, maybe a little bit too fast. I think he learns a bit too fast to be realistic. Um, and he kind of like, he learns things that he wasn't taught. He, he, he like, um, he, he says the line, I need a vacation. Like nobody taught him to say that. So I guess his computer kind of computed it as learning. I don't know, but it w it was realistic, but I think he just learned a little too fast to be human. I think it would take a little bit more time, but that's like tiny nitpick. That's tiny nitpick territory. But it was a little fast. Um, but I mean, the movie's two and a half hours, so what you, what can you do? You only have a little <laughs> limited amount of time. Uh, hasta la vista, baby. That's great. Everybody knows that line. Even if they don't know exactly which Terminator movie it's from, they know it's from the Terminator. They know it's from a Terminator movie, and they know Schwarzenegger is the one who... Uh, made that line famous other than James Cameron writing it but you know so yeah it was it was a great conclusion and I like the the last line by Sarah you know if a terminator a machine can learn to value the meaning of life of, of human life then maybe we can too and uh, you know continues with the no fate but what we make and everything uh, it's a cool cool ass film that deserves all of its praise and all of its glory and uh, it uh, it's one of the best sequels ever made easy James Cameron knows his sequels with both Aliens and this, and he perfected both of them as sequels. Um, spoiler alert, I do like the original Alien better than Aliens as well. <laughs> I'm more of like an original guy, I don't know. But uh, Terminator 2 Judgment Day was fantastic from 1991, and I can't disagree with anybody saying that this is their favorite film of all time or their favorite Terminator film. Makes sense. And uh, it's a great follow-up to the first one. And it's great to see Schwarzenegger as the, excuse me, as the hero. I, I can't uh, doubt that either. Or I can't deny that either because, you know, he's a good guy. He's your hero. You know, you want to see a, a menacing dude be on your side, not the villain side. So that's cool too. But overall, it's a great film. I have nothing to, other than those nitpicks that I've mentioned, there's nothing bad that I can say about this film. It's very, very good. Subscribe to Morgan Film Fan if you like to listen to my voice or if you like my film reviews. I'll be back with more soon, so stay tuned for those. Check out what's on the channel already. Stay tuned for what's coming. Until next review, have a good one. Take care and cheers.